Welcome to the Salem Tavern, built in 1784. This is where visitors from all over would have stayed when coming to visit the town of Salem here in North Carolina. Because of all of those people traveling from different places, bringing their culture, their languages, and their goods with them, this becomes one of the most culturally diverse places in the town of Salem. Today, I'm having tea and ginger cakes and spending a little bit of time thinking about how all of these different ingredients would have come here to Salem. The ginger cakes I have with me today are really more like what we would call cookies. Some of the ingredients that these cookies would include are things like cinnamon or cassia. This is the cinnamon that you might recognize that we use in most baking today. But it starts out as a bark coming from a tree that normally would be growing in places like Sri Lanka, which is very far away. Other spices that these cookies would include are things like cardamom, which is coming from India, or things like cloves, which was actually coming from Indonesia and then was traded by Arab traders into the Middle East. From there, it would be bought by the English and then sold here in the colonies. So these spices are coming from all over and all of these different spices from very far away are ending up in my cookies. But the most important ingredient that's going into both my cookies and my tea is sugar. And as much as we use sugar in our ingredients today, it was even more important in the 1800s. Sugar was starting out as raw cane sugar coming from places like the Caribbean. And a lot of times people could be getting cane syrup or molasses to use to sweeten their goods, but it's also being used as a preservative. So if I have food that I don't want it to go bad, I don't have a refrigerator during the 1800s. So things like candied lemon peel, or jams and jellies. Sugar is helping keep those foods from going bad. So sugar is a very important part of life in the 1800s. Just look at this sugar chest. It's a big chest and that's a lot of sugar that somebody would be storing. Do you think you need to store that much sugar in your house today? These tea leaves are just dried leaves from the tea plant, and they would have been coming from China or India at this time period. Those tea leaves would have been sold to England, and then England would have sold them back to people like me here in America. Now, all of these goods that are coming from other countries are what we call imports. So people here in the colonies are buying these items from England, and England is buying them from all of those different countries. An import is a good that I purchase from outside of where I live. But here in Salem, we also had goods called exports. Exports are goods that we sell to other places. And during the 1800s, a lot of the places here in America were responsible for producing what we call raw goods. But here in Salem, the most popular exports were things like buckskin or leather. That's coming from the skin of deer that would have been hunted here in Salem and sold to England to be turned into breeches or pants. The other most important export from Salem was tobacco. Here I have some dried tobacco leaves. This would be grown here in the area and then exported to England where it would be ground down into fine powder called snuff. That snuff would then be sold back to people here in America to be used in their pipes for smoking or inhaled through the nose. Now, of course, today we know smoking is bad for us, but at this time period, people believed that tobacco was good for your health. To help us make sense of where all of these things are coming from, it might help us to look at a map. With this map, you can see how goods are traveling back and forth from America to England, England to Africa, Africa to the Caribbean, or back to America. And on a surface level, this kind of is starting to look like a triangle. In fact, this trade route is what's known as triangle trade. But this geometric route gets its shape from a very important underlying current. Maybe we can get my friend Joel to help us get a deeper look at why this works the way that it does. A current is the flow of water caused by gravity as the water moves downhill in a creek or a river. When the warmer water of a creek or a river flows into the cold water of the ocean, there's a change in density. Density is the compactness of a substance. 
Ocean water is denser than fresh water because of the salt content. And when these two bodies of water meet, the changes in temperature and density cause ocean current. To demonstrate this, we poured warm fresh water, which we colored red, into cold salt water, which we colored blue. Look at how these two bodies of water move and begin to separate. This exchange drives the movement of ocean currents. This same thing happens with warm and cool air, creating air currents like the trade winds. It turns out that when you apply this concept of changing density to the whole ocean, you start to notice a pattern. Melting ice water from the Arctic trades places with warm coastal waters in the Atlantic and takes on a particular shape. Notice anything familiar? Hey, that looks like the Triangle Trade Route. So it's really like the ships are just following the trade winds or the Gulf Stream natural currents in the air and the ocean because it made for easier sailing. On the surface level, yes. But think a little bit deeper about who would have been producing those goods and who would have been responsible for them. Think about who would have been working in the kitchen you're standing in right now. Joel is talking about the labor and farming knowledge coming from enslaved people kidnapped from Africa. Even here in this tavern kitchen, an enslaved woman named Louisa was responsible for making all of the food for all of those travelers who were coming through here. I can think about her now, making cookies with sugar harvested by enslaved people in the Caribbean, from spices harvested by enslaved people in India and Africa, and serving tea that was traded on the backs of enslaved trade workers. Even wearing clothing that was made from cotton that was harvested by enslaved people. And here she was serving food to people who own other people. And while none of these people were getting paid to know how to grow these things or to do the harvesting, English tradesmen were getting paid to sell these things back and forth. English merchants were getting paid for the trade that all of these goods were doing. Every time one of these goods went from one location to another, someone was getting rich. It just wasn't the people doing the work. You can see how on the surface level, it seems like all of this trade is riding on those ocean currents and air currents going back and forth. But on a deeper level, the trade is really riding on the currents of the stolen labor of all of these enslaved people. And that takes a lot of people. The number of African people kidnapped during the transatlantic slave trade is estimated at approximately 12.8 million people. That's 88 people per day, every day, for 400 years. These people were transported in custom-built ships meant to maximize profit, so they were packed in as tightly as possible. And the two-month journey started at a coastal fort like Ghana's Elmina Castle and ended somewhere in the Caribbean. This became known as the Middle Passage. I can see why it's called the Middle Passage. That section between Africa and the Americas is the middle part of the triangle. Exactly. Where enslaved people ended up was determined by the skill sets that they had. For example, people like the Wolof, Yoruba, and Mandinka were targeted for their rice growing skills and they were brought to the Carolinas and to Georgia to grow Carolina gold rice. Other cultures like the Seninke from Senegal were targeted for their ability with dyes and brought to the colonies to work with indigo. Wherever trade products went, African people with the skill sets to utilize them were forced to follow. So do we know how many enslaved people survived the Middle Passage to come work here in Salem? Research is still being conducted, but we do know that there were a significant number of enslaved Africans who survived the passage and made it to Salem. The Hidden Town Project continues to work towards rediscovering and honoring the stories of both free and enslaved Africans and African Americans in Salem. The Tavern Room of Reflection and Meditation, where we're sitting now, is part of that effort. This room was created for the purposes of meditation, reflection, and contemplation on the lives and experiences of enslaved Africans and African Americans in Salem. The pews on which we now sit are the same pews on which the enslaved congregants of St. Philip's Moravian Church sat to hear the announcement of emancipation on May 21st, 1865. When I think about what this story means for the town of Salem and America in general, I think of it almost like a deeper current underneath the warmer waters of how we've been talking about our history. It's there all the time, influencing everything. It's how this nation was built. Absolutely. Every step that the United States took forward in solidifying its place as a nation was a step backwards for millions of African people. Because of the decisions that European colonizers made as they floated along the currents of triangular trade, they guaranteed that the perspectives, beliefs, and cultures of African people would sink to the bottom, all but forgotten. 
There are some who would argue that this was worth it. But when you look at the lives and the beautiful cultures lost, it's hard to make that argument.